Welcome to the Playbook for Amazon podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lieber, and the goal of this podcast is to share what's working today that's helping my company, Turnkey Product Management, sell over eight figures per year on Amazon for our clients. We will share with you the actionable steps, systems, and playbook that you can plug into your business to boost your sales on Amazon. Let's go. In this episode of Playbook for Amazon podcast, we interview Kevin Liang, a 26-year-old who runs multiple brands doing seven figures. In it, we talk about how they pre-sold over a million dollars of products on Kickstarter before putting their products on Amazon and Shopify. We also talk about how to amass a 125,000-person email list. We talk about the hiring funnel that Kevin uses to have a team of over a dozen all-stars that he has today. We also cover the number one networking tip that allowed Kevin to become a super connector by the age of 26. Enjoy. Hey guys, so we got Kevin Liang here. We've been friends for almost three years now, and uh, we've worked very, very closely together over the years. And uh, he's got a really, really amazing story and amazing company. And uh, we're going to be sharing some of the biggest lessons that he's learned over the last few years. So, uh, but first, Kevin, why don't you catch everyone up? What is the company that you're running right now? And uh, just give them a little background. Yeah, sure thing, Jeff. So uh, the company is called Aqua Design Innovations. We have several brands under the parent company now, but the two that we're most well known for, first is the EcoCube. We started with the EcoCube Aquaponics Aquarium. It was a desktop aquarium that uses plants to filter the aquarium water. So you never have to change the filters or the aquarium water. And we launched that in 2014. And actually, to date, it's still the largest aquarium crowdfunding campaign ever on any platform. So we're super proud of that. And then the uh, second brand that uh, we're now becoming more and more well known for is Aspen Growbox. So, and the brand is Aspen. And we really took um, what we had built for the EcoCube, the aquaponics and hydroponics technology. So I talked a little bit about the EcoCube Aquarium. The second product after the EcoCube Aquarium was a product called the EcoCube Air. It's a desktop hydroponic system that uses uh, plants and air filters to improve air quality. But it was app enabled. It watered itself. It had the perfect spectrum of LEDs. And so we really just spun off the technology we built in EcoCube Air. Uh, to a larger scale um, product called Aspen Grow Box for growing cannabis. So the Aspen Grow Box uh, grows your cannabis for you, and it has the perfect amount of lighting, airflow. It's got an air filter to help with the uh, cannabis flower uh, odors, and then it waters it for you. So yeah, so that's awesome. So take me back a little bit back in time, because like now you've launched so many different brands, and those products are all very complex you know i've seen them i've used them the design of them i mean it's incredible and it's a lot different model than a lot of you know other you know companies selling on amazon or you know getting into a a product niche um so you've taken a path where the product design is really quite quite challenging so how did you you know get started say just with your first ever product you know um like how did that process go and how did you get good at product design you know it was uh It was trial by fire, Jeff. So (laughs) I had worked in an aquarium shop since I was very, very young, 15 years old here in San Francisco. And the one, you know, pain point and problem that everyone had was they would come in and see these beautiful living decorations and living ecosystems, but they wouldn't know how to put it all together. You would have to buy the tank separately and get a filter and a light and you would have, and then maybe even a heater if you live in a colder place. And you would have to put it all together. We would, uh, at the aquarium shop that I worked at, we would sell uh, carbon dioxide injection systems. So almost like systems that you see people use for brewing beer to inject carbon dioxide into an aquarium to get plants to grow and flourish in order to outcompete the algae. Because the carbon dioxide was sort of the limiting factor for these plants underwater to grow. And all that is to say it was super complicated. And that was the big barrier to entry for customers. And it was extremely hard to control all these variables from carbon dioxide levels to how much lighting you're putting in. And so with the very first EcoCube, what I did was I just simplified it 
I, you know, hired uh, someone at UCSD while I was still going to school school there actually to help prototype and draw and 3D print um, the very first version of the EcoCube Aquarium where we had plants growing above water. So it's, you know, called aquaponics and the plants, because it's above water and it has access to carbon dioxide, it grows uh, up to two times faster in half the amount of space. And uh, as an end result, it can absorb all the nitrogen fish waste and, that accumulates inside an aquarium and causes algae growth. And that's why people do uh, water changes in an aquarium. And again, that was one of the biggest pain points that um, I saw at the fish store that worked out. And so to answer your question of how uh, I got started, it was really just um, taking that aquaponics concept that a lot of people didn't know about and putting it into a familiar form of an aquarium and simplifying it, putting the lights, giving the plant enough carbon dioxide by putting it above water, uh, having a built-in filter and all connected to one plug to take out as many variables as possible and simplify the entire process of aquascaping and aquarium keeping for the, for the customer. Gotcha. Pretty simple stuff there. <laughs> so once you have the, the idea and you go to source it, where did you go to launch it? Did you start on Kickstarter first or did you try a different method? Yeah. So we, um, the idea was to prototype it and then go license it to, uh, aquarium led manufacturers because our, the filter and the, and the aquaponics filter we built for the eco cube, there's a, a led attached to it. So that was the original idea. And it turned out that these potential people that, uh, would license the product and the idea want validation first. So at the time it was 2012, 2013, and you know, you would see the pebble Kickstarter campaign on the news and, and Kickstarter was really, really just starting to take off. And so I said, wow, these other people did it. Of course I can too. So I uh, read and researched everything I could about launching your own crowdfunding campaign, your own Kickstarter. And sort of what I did uh, when I was obsessed with uh, aquariums um, during my teenage years, I did the uh, very similar thing. I read basically, you know, just searched how to launch a crowdfunding campaign, read every single article from, you know, page one to, to page five. And the, the best one that I found actually, and I think it's still one of the best, is um, a hacking Kickstarter article on Tim Ferriss's blog, where uh, Mike Del Ponte, uh, the founder and CEO of Soma Water, shared his first, you know, all the preparation he did and sort of the step by step uh, process he took to uh, launch his very first Kickstarter. And I literally just followed that as closely as possible and did as much work, worked on it as hard as possible. And, um, you know, kind of just hope from hope for the best from there. But I think, at you know, by the day that we launched, we had accumulated a significant email list built a large enough audience. I know, uh, you know, Ryan talks a lot about that on his podcast, but we built an audience to launch it to and we really tried to make sure that uh, we would have as close to 100% success as possible. So that's sort of the first step that we took. Nice. That's awesome. And so what was your goal, your minimum goal that you said? And then what, what did you end up with at the end of the campaign? Yeah. Uh, so the first uh, Kickstarter campaign for the EcoCube Aquarium, the goal, you know, I did sort of all the math for the tooling and the first manufacturing run. It was about you know, $35,000. So I set the goal at $39,000. Um, 39 was my uh, high school football jersey number. So it's like always been my favorite number. Um, so I set it for 39,000. And I remember we had surpassed $20,000 in the first uh, 24 hours. And that was the, you know, before that I had helped, you know, wealthy people set up these, you know, living decorations and ecosystems uh, inside a, an aquarium for other people. And I had had a service based business to make money, right. But this was really the first time where I had experienced, um, 
you know, making money in my sleep, if you will, right? We had launched a campaign and overnight, you know, I went to sleep and woke up the next day and, you know, the crowdfunding campaign increased by $10,000. And uh, it was, it was crazy. And that really got me hooked to um, not just crowdfunding, but selling physical products. Oh, and then to answer your question, how much do we end up with? So we ended the campaign roughly about 42 or 43 days later, the first campaign, um, and raised about $80,000. This was in 2014. We spent uh, a whole year, you know, figuring out how to manufacture a product and rent a warehouse and deliver it. And it was, uh, you know, every time I kind of think about it or see pictures and short videos I took of it, it was, um, it makes me want to puke a little bit because it was so hard. But uh, a year later, after we fulfilled on the first product, we launched our second um, crowdfunding campaign, which is the EcoCube C. And that was really our breakthrough moment. We implemented everything that we had learned from manufacturing, launching a crowdfunding campaign in 2014. That campaign, the I believe the initial goal was $10,000 because we were able to get the manufacturing and tooling costs down from the second camp, um, from learning from the first campaign. And we reached, uh, we ended the campaign with uh, $375,000 in pre-orders. Nice. So for those of you that haven't gone the Kickstarter crowdfunding route, because a, a lot of probably listeners, what they do is they go you know, look at a niche on Amazon or somewhere, they find the product niche and they say, okay, that looks like a good market to get into. They go source it go buy a thousand units, pay for it all, you know, up front. They haven't sold a unit yet. And then you launch it on Amazon and maybe you launch on your website and you kind of cross your fingers and, and hope for the best that it takes off. With your model, it sounds like the difference is that you're getting pre-orders. So you were able to raise over $370,000 and you hadn't even produced a single product or ordered it yet. You just had built a prototype. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. And so... To back it up for listeners that maybe they should consider this model, who, who might it make sense for, mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, even if they're already in business, I, I would argue you can also, even if you're already doing, if you've never done Kickstarter, but you, you already have a brand, you're on Amazon, you're on your website, you can still launch new products, your next version of a product on Kickstarter first, right? Yeah, I, I absolutely encourage, uh, I think, by the way, I think that's how, you know, crowdfunding is going to grow, I think. And I've been saying this since, you know, 2015. But I think all the existing companies with the existing brand will start like coming to crowdfunding or Kickstarter, or whatever platform may be leading crowdfunding in the future. You know, for example, let's, you know, let's say uh, Nike launched a new shoe. Why would they not uh, launch a crowdfunding campaign? Because they've already built all the marketing assets. They, instead of launching their traditional way, they could uh, launch their new shoe on a crowdfunding platform and take pre-orders instead to validate the product, take the cash for manufacturing, de-risk the entire process before... It, and let's say the crowdfunding campaign goes okay, then they know the market acceptance for the product is normal. But if the crowdfunding campaign goes bonkers and goes, you know, 37 times above their goal, like uh, the EcoCube C Aquarium did, then they know they can double down on that product, right? And double down on their even traditional marketing and build that uh, fan base and large audience before uh, launching into the traditional retail stores. What criteria and who would I recommend um, to do that, you asked, Jeff? I think... It's anyone that wants to build their audience exponentially. So to date, we have built an email list of about 125,000 people. Uh, more than half of that uh, audience in that email list and Facebook Messenger um, list was built from the crowdfunding campaigns. So even if you have an existing brand, it's uh, crowdfunding is an extremely um, powerful way to activate your current community get them engaged and uh, grow your list even more. And, you know, one of the criteria for it is, or the main criteria for it is it's that it's a unique product. You can't launch a product that, you know, someone else has just sourced on um, that and someone else can just source on Alibaba, right? It needs to be a, you know, semi original idea or a better mousetrap. Perfect. And so 
sounds like one of your superpowers definitely is building a list, building an audience. I know Ryan Moran obviously preaches that and I preach that as well and agree. So what would you say are the number one or number two ways to build that audience? Like how are you aggregating those people, uh, especially early on before you have all those assets and stuff? Yeah. So, uh, before, you know, I had built out a team and, and had an agency work on it and, and knew how to run Facebook ads. The very, very first thing was just uh, downloading all my personal contacts, right? I was, you know, 20, 21 at the time. And I had just gone into Gmail and downloaded my entire contact list, went onto LinkedIn, posted about it, directed everyone to a, a landing page where they could enter in their emails. And just by doing that and asking friends to do the same thing and writing out the message for my friends to post and share about share the product and the idea of aquaponics, we generated an email list of over 2,500 people uh, before the first launch um, of the first EcoQ in 2014 that generated about $80,000 um, in, in uh, pre-order sales. Now, when we went into our um, second campaign, I started using Facebook advertising and I would just run an ad to a giveaway campaign using viral sweep. So the ad would be, uh, you know, enter to, you know, one, get a VIP, uh, a sale price on the product that no one else will get because you're going to be the first one to the campaign. You'll be notified if you entered your email on the landing page. Two is you have the chance to win one for free. I want to emphasize though, just because there have been so many more giveaways since 2014, 2015, that you want to emphasize on the um, discounts so that you don't attract the wrong audience when you're building your list. And so uh, that was sort of my that was in 2015. That was sort of my first um, dabble into Facebook advertising. And at that point, I had just boosted my post. But now there's so many people that are so well versed in Facebook advertising, you can find them on Upwork, there's agencies out there to help you build your list. The, and the quality of the list is, is what uh, matters most. And that's why I started out with, you know, reach out to your personal contacts, because if you can't convince your personal contacts and your own email list to subscribe, um, to support your crowdfunding campaign, it's going to be hard for cold traffic, um, from your cold traffic from Facebook, uh, lead gen advertising to, to convert on your crowdfunding campaign. That's gold. I was taking notes there. That's great. Do you still use any of those giveaway softwares? We use them at, at Turnkey as well to help build an audience. Which which one are you using today that, that works? Yeah. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've kind of started uh, to slowly move away from giveaways. So the we still do giveaways. We don't use softwares anymore for it. We kind of just pick a random person. And the reason for that is because we focus m now more on the offer when we uh, uh, do lead gen advertising. So we talk about the product, this is the product, and this is the uh, offer. This is the, the potential deal you can get if you sign up onto the list. And we've seen those lists convert at a much higher percentage rate than if we ran a um, advertising campaign that's uh, where the offer was, you can potentially win one for free. Very cool. So let's fast forward to post Kickstarter life. So after you launch in products, then I assume from my memory, you would put them on to your Shopify store and Amazon. And you just kept doing that. You'd launch a new product, put it on Shopify, put it on Amazon. Those are your main three channels primarily, at least at, at that phase of, of your business. Yeah, that's right. So most straightforward thing was to um, put it onto Shopify. And at that point, we felt like we had been good enough at driving Facebook uh, cold traffic and lead gen to, to build a list. And we the hypothesis was we can continue to build that, build a list, and then put them through a sequence like we did for the Kickstarter and then convert them on our Shopify page. Um, and we did that. It was a learning process. We learned that uh, it uh, off of the crowdfunding platforms, it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, the conversion rates aren't quite as high. And so that's when we looked at uh, Amazon. And I was pointed to Amazon actually through Ryan's uh, zero to $1 million in 12 months uh, YouTube video. And that 
uh, helped me make the decision and make the commitment and allocate the company's resources 100% to Amazon. And so this was July 2016. We got the listing up onto Amazon and and uh, we were building the Amazon listing for the EcoCube line of products. And I think in uh, August 2016 was uh, when we met Jeff uh, and we started using turnkey services to um, grow the EcoCube sales on Amazon. And uh, in three months uh, after we hired Turnkey and your team, we grew from maybe eight, ten thousand dollars a month to fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month in sales. Uh, so thank you for that, Jeff. Yeah, you were actually, I think, our maybe our fourth client ever back in the day, back in 2016. Um, you were referred by our first client ever, who we're, we're all we're all good friends with now. So. So yeah, so that that was awesome, and it helps that you guys have a really high quality, awesome product. So you know, it sounds like you tried it. It's been so long. So you were trying it yourself because you had a team. You were great at building teams, and you you had people, but and you threw it up on Amazon, but sales were just not really taking off to the point. So what were the pain points, or what were we able to help with that that helped escalate it? You think? Yeah, now you're really testing my memory here, but. Uh... <laughs> I'll speak to what I can uh, remember. So the team at the time was really set up. It, it was a really small team. We had probably four or five people at the time. It was really set up to just engage with our email list and um, continue to build the list. And it was just myself and um, Evan, uh, sort of the director of operations for the company at the time, doing the Amazon portion. And so I felt like I had figured it out to a certain level. There were also a lot of low hanging fruits that we didn't scale, right? So one of them was the Amazon pay-per-clicks. I think when Turnkey had taken over, I was spending maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars a month. I think you know three months later we were spending ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month profitably on the pay-per-click side. Um, so that was one thing that Turnkey helped with. And then there were. Just the amount of experience you and your team had working with all the different clients and bring that into the EcoCube business and just kind of um, having a more tight system and uh, your already established team to go in and sort of do the same things that uh, you've done for other clients rather than sort of myself and Evan kind of figuring everything out. That really expedited the process of uh, how we were able to get to that fifty, sixty thousand dollar mark per month on Amazon. Yeah, no, I mean you guys are great. Like you said, your team was built for Kickstarter, product design, email marketing, launching products. Amazon was just a whole different beast. You guys didn't quite have the bandwidth at that time, and so yeah, we have the team to do that. So that was a great pairing, and that allowed you guys you guys launch a ton more products in the next year. So that went really well. Yeah, since then, since then, actually, we've launched, uh, you know, five additional products on on Kickstarter. So and on Shopify store. Yeah, I think it'd be really helpful for the listeners, because you are one of the most talented people that I've met, as far as building a team, hiring a team like you've grown very fast. Um, how many people do you have on your team right now? So we currently have 13 people on our team, t in total. Gotcha. And all the years that you've been hiring people and getting to that team of like 13 really, really strong people, what would you say for someone that's only has two or three or four people? Yeah, I think first it's uh, identifying the revenue generating activities of the business and um, systematizing and automating that. So one of the things, you know, an example we just talked about was sort of the Amazon channel, right? That was a revenue generating activity that I had discovered and then systematizing and automating that by um, hiring turnkey to do that. To, to do that uh, and do a much better job than I did uh, just by myself and with our director of operations. That's one of them. And we sort of did that in um, multiple areas, including our Shopify store, email uh, list management, um, content creation. We built systems around all those things that we felt like was important for the company to continue doing long term. Um, so identifying those things first. And then uh, we've come up with a pretty I would say unique process uh, and elaborate, but very simple on on our end <laughs> to uh, hire incredible people. 
And so we would basically try to, we would aim every time we hire. And I know you implement this system now too, Jeff, at Turnkey, but every time we hire for a specific position we're looking for, we try to get about uh, 100 to 150 different applications and resumes across all platforms, indeed.com, Craigslist, you know, college internship platforms, everywhere we post it. And we'd get the applications and we would have them send it to uh, email for a company like opportunities at adi.com or something. And in the, And we would ask on the job listing to send 10 reasons why they're awesome. Um, so no resume, nothing, just 10 reasons why they're awesome to the, to the email. And we do that because we want to see if people actually read it or if their resume is spamming, right? If their resume is spamming, they will also attach the resume. But if they actually read the listing carefully and they're detail oriented, which is people that uh, we do our best to hire for, then they would know to only submit 10 reasons why they're awesome for the job. And then we have an autoresponder on the opportunities at ADI.com um, that asks, uh, okay, please attach your resume and answer these, you know, 10 interview questions. But now it makes the process like kind of fun for us. We look at, you know, 10 reasons why people are awesome while skimming through people's sort of resumes and questions to the interview uh, or our interview questions. And it's all written down. So rather than having, you know, 10 or 100, in this case, individual interviews, we just send out our interview questions and have them answer it. And because if we send out the interview questions and the candidates aren't able to sit down and write out a good answer, having thought about it, then they're probably not a good fit. A lot of the company is built on like written communication. So we look at 10 reasons why they're awesome. And then sort of quickly, we glance over the resume and very, very quickly, we look at one specific question on the interview questions which is uh, how would you help improve the company with everything that you see on the internet? And based on the recommendation, we know whether they're interested in the business enough to look up our business and to make a proper um, suggestion because any business can always be improved. We're, we're looking for people that can take that initiative, right? So uh, after that, uh, we bring them in, instead of for an interview, we bring them in for an info session. So that out of the 150 people that apply, we try to get down to about 21 to 28 people. And, and why those specific numbers is because we try to have groups of six or seven come in for info sessions. The info sessions, we let them know this is not an interview, this is an information session. We've already asked you all the interview questions. Um, this is a uh, opportunity for you to uh, see if ADI, EcoCube, and Aspen Growbox is a good place for you to work and if it's, it aligns with your long-term goals. And they would come in and they would ask a lot of questions. And typically it's the same questions over and over again, but then you can see the people that take initiative and the people that leave an impression uh, on me, and they're all about uh, one hour each. So now all of a sudden I'm meeting 21 uh, people or 28 people in three to four hours, right? And usually in an hour with six people, you know, you can get, get a very, very, very good feel for who are the ones that are proactive. And then I go back and look at their um, interview questions as well as their resume and the 10 reasons why they're awesome. And then we very quickly get down to um, just a, a dozen or two and uh, we give them all test projects. And the test projects are very, very similar to the job that they would have uh, applied doing. Usually it's about, you know, breaking down a specific problem or case study and then writing out steps that they would take because we want to understand how they think and how they approach solving problems. And um, the test project is also extremely elaborate and requires um, at least an hour or two of uh, watching YouTube videos like Ryan Moran's uh, zero to a million, 12 months, and then coming up with like, say, an Amazon plan if they were applying to be an Amazon assistant, right? Account assistant or something. And then they would write out a plan and then we would review that and decide on which ones we feel like we should hire and then do one final phone call or interview. So the whole process, you get down from 150 people to five or less 
um, without spending more than three to four hours in the info sessions. And uh, that process has served us extremely well. Yep. Yeah, we copy a very similar model to that now at Turnkey, and it's worked really, really well. Do you, remind me, do you pay for the test projects when you're making them do that, that you know, case study or what have you? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely do. Okay, so you, you say, okay, if, if it's going to roughly take three hours and it's a $20 an hour job, you might pay them 60 bucks or maybe a little bit more just to be generous to, to them and, and give them a reason to do it? Yep, that's right. Because that's how you can attract the highest quality candidates too, right? Yeah, yeah, because candidates will smell from a mile away. They're going to be skeptical, like, well, wait, I got to do work in order to, I haven't even talked to anyone one-on-one. -on -one. And if you try to get it for free, they're not going to do it. They're going to be like, well, this they're just scamming me for a free case study or blog article. So I highly recommend doing what you do is, is pay, pay them fairly for it. That's a good point. Great. So then that's what helped you build your team. And as your company evolved and you had more products and then now you had more team and they were helping manage the whole Shopify side of things. And that was growing from what I remember. So then at a certain point, you needed more hours for your current team members and they, you hired some really talented, you know, marketers and people. And so I think at that point, that was when you, you said, hey, you know, I think it may actually make sense if we move to to. PPC management only and not full service management um, because you had other team members at that time that could take over all of the other aspects. So then you switched to PPC only with us. And that was also when around the time that we had launched the inner circle coaching so that we had a coach for you that, you know, helped train your specific team members. Is that when that happened? I'm trying to remember exactly. Yeah, that's uh, very accurate. Actually, we um, we have an incredible, incredible team now that uh, handles uh, almost all aspects of uh, Amazon now, and uh, a lot of that is um, thanks to uh, you guys. Um, not just the one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also the course that you guys uh, have launched. Um, so all the team members that even touch Amazon. Um, in, in our business uh, have gone through that entire course so that they could get all your SOP standard operating uh, procedures and um, go through that checklist and to make sure we we don't miss uh, anything or any of the things that um, you guys did that were effective uh, for our business. Yeah, no, seriously, like half of the stuff that we've launched at Turnkey was actually just to cater it to your guys' business. As your business was evolving, we're like, oh, we can help with that, but I'm going to have to hire a couple more people or we're going to need to launch a course or what have you. But then we said, well, you know, if their business needs it, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more that could, you know, that could use those services. And so, um, yeah, I have, you, I have you guys to thank for, uh, for, for just, you know, communicating that stuff to us because it's been really fun to evolve together. Absolutely, man. It's been a real pleasure, dude. Nice. And so with now where your business is at today, um, where do you see your business going in the next few years? Yeah. So the EcoQ business, you know, that was started in 2014, 2015 officially. It's gone to a fairly mature point where the team is managing it. I mean, I still spend some time trying to grow it, but I'm, you know, I would say I spend 80 plus percent of my time uh, working on the Aspen Grow Box and, you know, uh, the new brands that we were launching. The Aspen Grow Box, I talked a little bit about it in, in the beginning of the podcast. So I feel like uh, with Aspen Grow Box, we have significant amount of value to deliver there. Um, our core competency, as you mentioned previously, has been you know, launching the crowdfunding campaigns, really acquiring our first, you know, 100 to, you know, 10,000 customers, right, through crowdfunding and building community. Uh, but it's also in product development. We have an immense uh, amount of uh, experience working with dozens of uh, different factories. And answer your question, the, the Aspen Grow Box is really what I've been really focused on. Yeah, I think that has huge, huge potential from what you guys are doing. So best of luck with that. So a quick topic change. So you're actually one of the best people that I know at networking, at building relationships with people. And, and you're like a super connector of people. You've connected me with so many people. And, you know, I always want to try to return the favor. 
to you because you always do that. And you're, you know, how old are you? You're 26, 27 now. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, at 26, you've got one of the largest networks that I, I know of. So what, what has helped you to grow your network and actually build real relationships with people? It's one thing to share a business card or add someone on Facebook, but you actually have relationships and conversations with people, you know, it seems like dozens or hundreds of people. Ever since I was a kid, I've always just liked talking to people, <laughs> right? Like the, I would always get in trouble um by uh with the teachers saying i i talk too much in class to other kids and i distract them etc so in in a certain sense it was it was um instilled into me you know just the way i was raised or i was born but i think where i really really was able to the pivotal point that um i was really able to connect with people uh was when i heard a mentor of mine speak about at any events or any given place you are in, in a social uh, setting, you don't need to feel the pressure to have to talk to any everyone and anyone and pass out give business cards. You just need to find one person that you can have an interesting conversation with. And I was like, wow, like that's that's fairly easy. You know, I think anyone can do that actually. But the key point there is to identify that one person you can connect with to have a meaningful conversation with, right? Because it's hard to have a meaningful conversation with uh, someone that you're not interested in, you know, to be frank. So I've picked up that habit when I was, you know, 17, 18 years old. So at any social setting, it's almost natural now. I just kind of, I don't try to network. I try to identify the one person that I feel like would pique my interest and we would have a meaningful conversation with. And a meaningful conversation could mean five minutes. It could also mean five hours. That That's how I've done it. And in every single social setting, I, I get to meet one person. And because I'm interested in them and I'm interested in what they have to say and it was a meaningful conversation, it's it's very, very natural for me to have a thought about that person in my head later on down the line, or I, you know, consume enormous amounts of audiobooks and podcasts and, to sh and, and YouTube videos too. I would just share things with them that I find or articles that I run into that remind me of them just because I, I thought of them. Maybe once a quarter or something, you know, during a holiday or something, I always sort of just go back in my list of texts or emails and I just, you know, anyone that I haven't, you know, talked to for, you know, six, 12 months, I, I, I look through, wow, I talked to them six months ago and it's, you know, Thanksgiving or, or whatever it is right now. And I'm just, I just say happy Thanksgiving. Um, hope you've been well and have a great Q4. You know, <laughs> I think everyone appreciates uh, getting a message like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. I need to get a lot better at that. So the next question is you're also one of the best people you always have you know, new things that you're testing as far as, you know, whether it's morning routine stuff or body hacks, or you introduced me to uh, MCT oil, um, things that seem to, you know, increase your productivity and, and setting you up for a successful, happy day. Um, what, what are some things that you have in your routines or that you have going on right now that uh, you can share with everybody? Yeah, I mean, I think I always look for ways to be better. And um, frankly, I try to find, you know, shortcuts, right? The easiest and fastest way to get to the the point that I want to get to. Nothing, you know, that brand new. Um, I, I really like the idea of, you know, making a 1% improvement every single day because it compounds it helps me think a little bit long, longer term. And I know in two years, I'm going to be a significantly better version of myself if I just make a, you know, incremental improvement every single day. All right, Kevin. Well, uh, that was really, really helpful. I learned a ton and I think a lot of people will learn a ton. Um, is there anywhere, any last words or anywhere people can find you to reach out more? Yeah, I think, you know, what I said earlier about the having meaningful conversations. Um, I've been very fortunate to have met lots of really incredible people, uh, including yourself and, and 
and I felt very um, selfish keeping these conversations and these contacts and relationships to myself. And that's why I always try to share them with you, Jeff. But to share them with the world, um, I launched a podcast called The Trailblazer Show. So you can find it on Instagram at The Trailblazer Show. The website's thetrailblazershow.com. Um, and then to find me, I am on LinkedIn as uh, Kevin Z Liang, uh, L I A N G. I am on Instagram at Ideas by Kevin, just the way it uh, it sounds. And you can find me there. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. It's been fun. And uh, yeah, th- thanks again, man. See you later. All right, let's talk about what can we take away and apply to your business from that conversation with Kevin Liang. A couple ideas are, number one, his model is to launch on Kickstarter whenever he wants to launch a new product because it's a whole other platform to launch on. You can actually pre-sell your product. Is that something that you can include in your business model? Uh, Do it. The products that you want to launch in the future lend itself to a platform like Kickstarter. Even if you don't plan to launch new products on Kickstarter or have something that's proprietary or unique, what you can apply is his model of building a huge launch list to launch your product to. He has over 125,000 emails. I think they have over 30,000 customers that have paid them over $100. Uh, The strategies that we covered in there, that can apply even if you're not using Kickstarter. How can you apply that to whether it's Amazon or whether it's sending traffic to your Shopify store? It doesn't matter which channel that you're using, but the strategies he talked about as far as amassing an audience on Messenger, on an email list, whether it's sending them to a giveaway page or giving them some sort of a discount or something that incentivizes them to give you your info so that you follow up with them and spread the word about your product, can you apply that on a higher level in your business? And then next, he talked about the hiring process, right? His whole hiring funnel is genius. We use it here at Turnkey with our team. That's how we hire. Think about it. Is there one aspect of that hiring funnel that Kevin outlined that you could apply to your business that would save you time the next time that you hire, right? He doesn't actually, if you get 100 applications, he's not getting on the phone with 100 people, right? He, he doesn't go there. He has multiple steps that have to happen first that don't require any of his time. It's pretty much automated and that filters it down from over 100 applications down to 25 or 15. And then you start giving him those additional layers. So uh, make sure and go back to listen to that segment and think about how can you apply that to your business. And then lastly, think about that networking tip that Kevin shared and that allowed him to become a super connector. Uh, He's only 26 years old and he has a huge network of probably over 100 people by now that he truly has built a relationship with. And like you said, he keeps it simple. He just tries to have a meaningful conversation with one person or more at each event. It doesn't try to go talk to all 100 people at an event. Just try to focus on finding one or two really, really interesting people that you, you know, resonate with and can build a relationship with. And then he follows up with them, you know, whether it's six months from now or just on an annual basis, just making sure you're, you're, you know, sending a text message, sending a Facebook message, just to keep in the loop with that person and check in with them, ask if you can add any value. Um, Those simple things can really add up over time. So I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. I sure did. I learned a lot. I literally was taking notes the entire time. So I hope you can take a lot away from that and just want to say thank you to Kevin for that wonderful interview. Thank you very much and we'll catch you next time.